Hello and welcome. My name is Rob Sirowick, Fortinac Systems Engineer with Fortinet, and today we'll be showing you a demo of Fortinac, our network access control product. So before we begin, it's important to really understand the definition of NAC. So Gartner defines network access control as technologies that enable organizations to implement policies for controlling access to corporate infrastructure by both user-oriented devices, right? So your laptops, your mobile phones, and your desktops, as well as cyber physical devices or OT devices, right? Such as print printers and IP phones and surveillance cameras and door controls and, and all these other things that connect to our networks. Policies may be based on authentication and endpoint configuration posture. So this means we're looking past the actual AAA process of authenticating and authorizing the user, but we're also verifying and validating that the asset that they're using to connect is safe to use and in accordance with our policies. And finally, NAC can also implement post-connect policies based upon integration with other security products. And this is really powerful because we talk about other security products as policy enforcement points or ways that we can mitigate or control traffic flows. So that includes our switches, it includes our firewalls like the FortiGate and some other technologies that come into the data path between the endpoint and the resource. So today we're gonna focus on the base features, which are gonna be the five at the top, visibility, getting an understanding of what's connected to the network and where it is, guest access management, so the on-ramp for the guest user to the network, endpoint compliance, which is important, that's measuring and monitoring continuously the posture of the endpoint through different tools, whether it's a dissolvable agent like we have patented within our portal or using third-party service connectors like Microsoft Intune. And then we have secure BYOD, which allows us to obviously onboard personal devices that are used by employees for safe use, whether it's just for internet or for accessing some internal resources as well. Well, for network segmentation, NAC is really important at being able to understand what devices are and then to be able to then match them to their appropriate network policy to determine access through access segmentation. So we're going to focus on the big five here under base features today when we go through our demo. FortiNAC is a web managed platform that can be deployed as either a physical appliance. So it could be on site in your data center. It could be a virtual machine. So that would run on either Hyper-V or VMware or KVM. Nutanix is also supported. And ultimately, we can also deploy this in the cloud as an IaaS instance within Azure or AWS. We begin with network inventory. So the inventory is the critical first step that we take in doing an assessment or being able to understand what's connected and where. So with our inventory tool, we actually use the system of logical containers, which are these objects here, such as Office and VPN. And we essentially leverage these to represent physical sites or local virtual sites. And then we can start to use credentials to go out and do discovery scans to find all of our infrastructure. So I'm able to actually go in here and provide either a list of IP addresses for my infrastructure or use CDP to be able to provide a single seed address and then be able to crawl using CDP or LDP from that core and find all the other devices. I'm also going to populate my SNMP and CLI credentials. So CLI, we support both Telnet and SSH. Obviously, SSH is recommended, but we're going to leverage those credentials to go out and create a scan of the location. So that scan is going to go out and try the credentials and identify infrastructure. That infrastructure could be switches, it could be wireless access points, or it could be firewalls or routers. So once we actually identify those infrastructure devices, we can model them and modeling just means we represent them in the system and then we're able to understand the endpoints that are connected to that device. So the way we do that is we leverage these credentials to pull the switch to be able to consume the MAC address table as well as the ARP table. And from that, we can understand exactly where everything is connected in real time. And that doesn't require us to use RADIUS, even though we fully support RADIUS and so we can use it. We have a RADIUS server on box for doing full leap termination and back off. We don't require it on switches. And a lot of folks decide not to use it on switches because it reduces complexity and it just makes it a lot faster to get started with NAC. Once you start to consume these feeds, we also provide MAC notification traps through SNMP as additional devices are connected so that we can stay abreast of what's happening in real time. Using these credentials, we can start to double click on switch ports, we can up down the interface, or we can change the VLAN configuration on it, all without having to log into the actual device itself. But as you can see here, we have these endpoints that are showing up, and we have the IP address and the MAC address for this device. And you can see it's also got an icon. So this has been classified by the NAC itself. In this case, I've got a web power switch and then I have an alarm system on port two. So the way we're classifying these endpoints depends on the type of device it is. So if you think about user-based devices, if you have smartphones or if you have laptops or maybe desktops, typically they're gonna be managed with some sort of a central management solution. So we have service connectors that allow us to essentially plug in third-party resources for trust. If you can imagine having 
AirWatch or even our own Ford Klein EMS or Microsoft Intune, this would allow us to leverage the API and connect to that service and then essentially get a list of all the devices that have been onboarded and managed by that solution and then import them into the NAC for us to trust. So essentially, we'll find all the devices, their device type, if it's Windows, if it's Mac, if it's iOS, we'll find the associated user that owns that device and we'll form a relationship between the user and that device for ownership. We can also start to understand if that device is passing its compliancy checks. So if you have any verification or compliancy rules that have a minimum posture for the endpoint, Fortinet can receive a verdict of that posture and then be able to leverage that throughout its policies to be able to restrict access or grant access to the network. The benefit of this is really the fact that once we plug in a service connector, we can discover all those trusted assets and it doesn't require any additional effort to onboard them into NAC. And subsequently, if you have devices that are lost, stolen, or just decommissioned, once they're removed out of Intune, they can be removed out of NAC itself. We can also leverage our own persistent agent. So we have a, an agent that we can deploy onto assets at no additional charge that will go out and verify their posture as well. But that is not a requirement. That is just a feature that we have that we can use if that device needs to be managed by something else and there's no domain membership or something else in place that we can leverage. So for other devices, perhaps, that are coming in from the third party, if you have maybe contractors or if you have guests or even BYOD initiatives, typically they require onboarding through some sort of a captive portal because we need to be able to collect some information about the user and then be able to onboard that device. The portal allows us to essentially have a device connect to either wired or wireless. Once that device is connected in a managed network, we're going to automatically move the endpoint into a registration VLAN where we can provide it a captive portal and allow it to safely register if it meets the requirements. So here for this example, I've defined UIOD guest and, and contractor as options for registration. So the user would land on the page much like walking into a start Starbucks or a hotel, and they would connect and be provided this captive portal automatically, they could click on one of these options. So BYOD would be a, a corporate user that's got maybe a personal device they want to connect to the Wi-Fi and get online. They can use their corporate credential and they'll be given some different access. Or we can differentiate between a corporate asset and their personal device. A guest is pretty simple. Somebody from outside the organization requesting access, they don't have an account. And contractor might be very similar. So for these two use cases, we can provide a sponsorship program wherein we allow the device to land on a portal and fill out a form where they can request access. And that request is then sent to a list of sponsors that can then check their email, read the request details, and approve or deny that request right from their email. We can also do some additional checks for these types of users where we can scan their device without requiring the use of administrative rights or the installation of software. And that's due to our patented dissolvable agent technology that's included within the captive portal. When the user registers their device, they can download a file, run the file to get scanned, and that file is not going to install anything or require admin rights, but it will provide some insight into the inner workings of the machine and understand if it's up to date with the required updates or if it's secure to use on the network. For non-user based devices or IoT devices, maybe you have projectors or you have IP phones or security cameras, they typically don't handle the installation of software very well. They don't have a user and they usually don't support .1x supplicants either. So for these types of devices, we actually leverage what's called device profiling rules. So our device profiling rules are a set of essentially policies from top to bottom that scan the existing pool of rogue devices, so devices that have not been classified yet, and they see if they match a fingerprint. And if that device matches the fingerprint, it can be automatically onboarded and moved out of the registration VLAN and into their respective network VLAN for whatever application. So a good example might be a projector. You might have a projector that is connected to the network. We can use several methods to identify that projector looking beyond the MAC address. We don't want to just rely upon a MAC address for things like that. So we can start with a MAC address as a filter and look for things that belong to this company. And then we can look deeper. Perhaps we want to see if there's a web server running on this machine on port 80 and if this path exists. We can also log into a secure web page, and we can also check to see if there's a string match across the web page itself. Perhaps we can use DHCP fingerprinting, which is a passive method. So this allows us to essentially be a recipient of DHCP requests as an IP helper, and we can fingerprint devices as they come online to see if they match their respective device types. We can also integrate with FortiGuard, which is our cloud-based profiling service. So essentially, we crowdsource the data from all of our customers, and we extract the endpoint heuristics to see if a device that you're scanning has been seen before in the wild we know what it is. So that's a passive method. We can also use things like, for example, SSH and SNMP to log into devices or perhaps look at what open ports are on the machine with TCP and UDP. So these methods can be put together to create a 
composite fingerprint beyond a MAC address. And then if the device being scanned matches on those methods, we can enable the rule. We can onboard this device automatically as projector or whatever the respective device type is, maybe even assign it a role. And then the good feature here is that we can check each time this device reconnects to the network, we can rescan it to see if these methods are still true. And if those methods no longer match, we can actually disable that device here as well. So you can rank these top to bottom, and they're a great way to be able to go out and identify all of your non-user-based devices by using different methods to be able to understand how devices communicate. Another good example here for a smart light bulb that I have is leveraging our FortiGate integration. I can actually consume a session feed from the FortiGate to understand how devices communicate. So in this example, I'm actually leveraging this communication flow of port 1883 as a destination to say that I'm going to trust this device and I know that it's a smart light bulb. So that communication pattern, as long as we see that session across the firewall, we can send that session up to the NAC, even though the NAC is sitting out of the data path, it does not have to sit in the data path at all, but it can be made aware of these sessions. And then it can obviously leverage this information to understand if this is a trusted device and what it is. So again, once we start to understand how these devices communicate and we onboard them and fingerprint them, we essentially have a searchable library of all these network devices. And we can see in real time down to the switch port where they're connected. A good use case might be a help desk user is investigating a problem. They want to quickly find where a machine is located, but they don't know much about the machine. So they can actually leverage the username of the user and they can search for that machine and drill into the adapters tab here. And they can quickly identify where that machine is located and they can see down to the switch port where it's currently connected. So another great side benefit above and beyond just the security capabilities. But once you have this inventory of these network connected devices, we can move on to the next phase of NAC, which is really that control phase. And that provides automation so that when devices connect to wireless SSIDs or if they plug into switch ports, we can automatically move them to the appropriate network segment to make sure they always have the correct policy and they have portability across wired and wireless as well. So the way that works within 40 NAC is we actually build out policies for that. So we have network access policies, and each of these policies is really composed of two parts. We have a profile and a configuration. The profile is really going to match the endpoints that need to be moved into a certain segment or have a certain configuration. And then the configuration part is going to actually define the VLAN or the ACL that will be applied when they connect. So the way this works, for example, is if you have a corporate accounting profile, you can use any number of characteristics. For example, you can use maybe a location group, which could be a group of ports or an SSID. But in this case, I'm actually leveraging this corporate accounting security group, which is something that I'm pulling from LDAP. So I have an Active Directory domain controller here that I'm pulling these from. And I'm able to say, if my endpoint is registered to a user that is a member of this security group, and down here I can leverage some endpoint details. So under adapter, I, I have access to all the adapter information. So in this example, I'm really just using my role, which is corporate, but I could be using a device type. So once I've got that selected, I've built my filter, and now I can go over here to my configuration and I can assign a logical network. So if I match my profile, I'm going to land this device onto a logical network called corporate accounting, and I can build as many of these as I want. This is all depending on what's necessary for your organization. But the idea here is that we have an abstraction called a logical network. So we're not defining a specific VLAN for every use case per policy because that would take us a very long time and that wouldn't be efficient. So we can associate these endpoints with a logical network, which is more like a segment. And then imagine you might have a different corporate accounting VLAN on every switch. So we can define that detail per switch, but we can loosely identify these endpoints and then be able to associate them to this abstraction here first. So if I move that device to the corporate accounting logical network and I go back to my inventory, you'll see that I'm now able to associate on my switch level here under model configuration, I can associate that logical network with an actual VLAN on my switch. So corporate accounting on my Cisco switch three is enforced and I'm able to actually see all of my VLANs that are available on the switch in this dropdown that's auto-populated and I can choose which VLAN I want to land my corporate accounting devices on. And if I want to go a little deeper, I can also send a CLI configuration that's going to add some additional config here. So I can use a description update and I can update that to be trusted colon the IP address of the connected endpoint. And if I disconnect that device, I can also do the undo version of that command sequence as well. So again, all of this is possible without RADIUS. If I wanted to enable RADIUS, I could do it here. I could use the NAC as a local RADIUS server, and I could even customize my response attributes as I need to, but not a requirement, just there if you need it.
For wireless, this would be managed very similarly. So we can manage either the individual access points if they're not controller-based, or we can manage a lot of controller-based access points just by adding the controller to the topology. And then we auto-discover all the access points and we manage those through the controller object. So very similar to how we manage a switch. Now, to get this to actually go into enforcement, what we do on the switch ports is we can right-click and add each individual port to a group, or we can add the whole switch or the entire container to a group, thereby enforcing all the interfaces. And enforcement really means this. It means once you enable enforcement and you start to fill in these blanks here, when you connect a device that's untrusted with a question mark, we're going to always move it to this registration VLAN. If you have a trusted endpoint that fails a compliancy check, and as shown as at risk, we're going to move it to this quarantine VLAN. And then if you right click and disable a device, we're going to move it to the dead end VLAN. If you have a trusted device that's on the network that's passing the quarantine check that doesn't have a failed scan, it's simply going to be able to match its policy. And then based upon the logical network it maps to, it'll receive the VLAN configuration that we see below. So pretty simple, easy to configure. And this can also be done globally. So we can map this configuration to a number of different available switches. It doesn't have to be done per switch. So once we establish network policy, we can move on to endpoint compliancy. And endpoint compliancy essentially is where we check the posture of the endpoint. So I have some sample policies configured here, but there's a couple ways we can handle this. We can scan an endpoint by leveraging our own tools. So we can leverage either a dissolvable agent through the captive portal, or we can use our persistent agent to scan the endpoint to enforce these policies, or we can simply receive a verdict if there's a service connector installed. So if we have Microsoft Intune, we could leverage Microsoft Intune's compliancy check, or if there's no managed system in place, or if you prefer to use the network access control for this, you can either leverage that dissolvable or persistent agent, and we can use those to scan the endpoint here as well. So an endpoint compliancy scan is pretty simple. You can configure it to look for any details on the machine. So for example, we can require certain operating systems, ban old ones. We can require specific security features to be enabled. And then we can also look at the antivirus solution that's installed on the machine and have requirements around which one needs to be installed and potentially up to date as we publish our own definitions. This could be used to basically baseline the endpoint and check for the posture. And then once we establish that posture, we can either pass or fail that machine based upon if it's in compliance with that rule. If a machine is found to be non-compliant, it could be marked as quarantine and moved into the quarantine view as we showed previously on the switch itself. We identify devices and we associate those devices to network policies so that they can actually be mapped to a VLAN or ACL when they connect to a switch port or to a wireless network. The other integration that we have with our FortiGates allows us to be able to single sign on those devices so we can share the classification of that endpoint up to the firewall and then we can allow the firewall to write dynamic policies using those tag objects. So let me show you that really quick. If we look at our firewall here, we can drill into our virtualized devices, which are our VDOMs, and then I can scroll down to reveal all of my logical networks. So these are essentially landing zones on the firewall where I can start to map some additional tags. So for example, if I have my corporate accounting device connected and it matches my network access policy, it will be associated with this logical network. On this firewall, I'm also sending a corp-accounting tag on behalf of this device to the firewall. So if I log in my FortiGate and I set up my fabric connector here with my NAC, I'm actually able to see all of those tags now pulling in. And so as those devices that I'm classifying on my edge get associated to those policies and those tags, I can go into my firewall and I can see those devices showing up in my firewall user monitor here. So if I check show all FSSO logins, I'm actually able to see all the devices that have been classified by my NAC. And now I can actually leverage these tags to create policies. So here I've got a user-based device, and then here I've got some non-user-based devices. And if I want to go to create a policy, I just simply go into create new. And under source, I can leverage my user tab. And if I scroll down, I will see the fabric and I can see my NAC tags right below. So here I can take devices that maybe were onboarded with NAC using the captive portal as BYOD and I can map those to a policy regardless of what interface or what source IP they're coming from. So this helps with being able to create much fewer policies and then be able to use NAC's classification ability to be able to tag these objects and then be able to have those dynamically match our policies. So that concludes our demonstration. Please let us know if you have any additional questions and have a great day.